Mahalo nui, ya oko apo, for coming tonight. We are so grateful to see all of you. And um, my name is Olanli Momi Morgan, and I'm one of the alaka'i for Aha Hui Oha um, And we're one, we're the oldest law student org organization here at the William S. Richardson School of Law. So um, we just wanted to give a mahalo before we start everything. Um, you guys have all your programs, so um, first I'd just like to mahalo Kumu McKenzie for helping us set all of this up. She's just an amazing teacher and person, and she just launched the Native Hawaiian Law Treatise that she was the lead on, so if we could just give a mahalo to her. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to mahalo all of the Aha Hui Hawaii members that are here helping. Um, they're all over, they're the ones passing out the comment cards and just giving out the lays. So I really appreciate every single one of you. Um, mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, mahalo nui to all of the panelists. We're just so grateful for each and every one of you coming here and putting yourselves and your mana'o out there. And I'm just so humbled to just, you know, be in the presence and to be able to work with each of you. So, mahalo nui for being here. Um, and also to OEV TV for filming this event to be able to reach so many more of our Lahui members and beyond. So, we're just so grateful to have you guys here. So, a big round of applause for OEV TV. So um, you guys have your programs, but basically this is the welcome and introduction part, and um, I'm gonna pass the mic on to Kumu, Kumu McKenzie, and she's going to introduce e each of the panelists. Um, you guys should have been given question cards, so if you can fill those out, or you can still hold on to them and fill them out while the panelists are speaking, if you know something comes to, m to mind. And just raise your hand, and we can one of our or one of our members can collect it from you. So mahalo. Um, aloha noi. Um, at, first of all, as the advisor to Ahuhuio Hawaii, I want to say how very proud I am of the 
initiative that they've undertaken to uh, present this panel tonight. And so I think there should, we des they deserve a round of applause as well. So tonight we're going to discuss some uh, very important and weighty issues for our community, issues that um, are contentious, but I hope that we can continue to discuss them in a calm and rational manner um, so that each position and idea can be fully expressed and heard. Um, and I call upon you as members of our audience to please respect our panelists, respect what they have to say in their manao. Um, tonight we have, first of all, William Mehula, who is a partner in a law firm of Sullivan, Mehula and Lee. Um, his practice includes many issues, including Native Hawaiian rights, and Bill has represented beneficiaries of the Hawaiian Homelands Trust and that resulted in the $600 million settlement that the um, Hawaiian Homes Commission, Hawaiian DHHL, received in 1995. He's also represented individual uh, Native Hawaiians in trying to stop the sale of ceded lands. And he's represented the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, in seeking back revenue uh, from the state of Hawaii, ultimately resulting in a number of parcels in Kaka'ako being transferred to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to be held in trust and for the future uh, Native Hawaiian nation. Bill currently represents Na'iaupuni, Na um, on its election of delegates, he is their advisor, and he also represents Na'iapuni in the Akina v. State case, which he may talk about, I hope, a little bit tonight. So, William Mehiula. Um, next, I'm very honored to present Derek Kaulanoi, who is the governance manager at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. He coordinates activities related to the facilitation of a Native Hawaiian self-determination process. Prior to uh, taking a position at OHA, Derek served on the faculty of Kahuliao here at the law school. Um, he graduated from our law school in 2008 with a Pacific Asian Legal Studies certificate with a specialty in Native Hawaiian law. And Derek co-teaches federal Indian law with me and is pursuing a PhD in political science that focuses on indigenous peoples, uh, politics, and future studies. Derek Kawanoi. <laughs> professor Jonathan K. Kamakaviva Ole Osorio is a full professor at Kamakakua Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies and has a PhD in history. He has developed and taught classes in history, literature, law as culture, music as historical texts, and research methodologies for and from indigenous peoples. His recent publications include The Value of Hawaii, Knowing the Past and Sharing, Shaping the Future, which he co-edited and authored, as well as Dismembering Lahui, A History of the Hawaiian Nation to 1887. And John is also a composer and singer and has been a Hawaiian music recording artist since 1975. Professor John Osorio. <laughs> Dr. Lili Kala Kimeelihiva is a senior professor at Kamakakua Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies and is its current director. She's trained as a historian and she's also an expert in Hawaiian cultural traditions and in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. She served as an executive producer of the 2005 DVD, Natives in New York Seeking Justice at the United Nations, and was the co-script writer of the 1993 award-winning documentary, An Act of War, The Overthrow of the Hawaiian Nation. Her books include Navahini Kapu, Sacred Hawaiian Women, Himolelo Ka'au, Ka'o, O Kamapua'a, a legendary tradition of Kamupua'a, the Hawaiian pig god, and most notably, I quote it often, is Native Land and Foreign Desires, Pehela e Ponoa'i. Lilikala Kame'elehiva. <laughs> 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 and 
And so we're going to proceed tonight with, we're going to begin with um, <coughs> Bill Meheula taking about 10 minutes to um, talk about the AHA process, Na'iau um, Puni. And then Derek Kawanoi will take about five minutes. <laughs> he will talk really, really fast. Um, then Professor Osorio, I think we have you down for 10 minutes. And Professor Kame'elehiva also for 10 minutes. And then we'll have questions and answers. And I encourage you, as our speakers are speaking, if a question comes to mind, please write it down. And we'll collect it and, and begin that discussion with the audience after their power talking. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. You know, my, uh, my primary practice is commercial litigation, real estate litigation, and, and every once in a while I have an opportunity and a privilege to represent the Native Hawaiian community. Um, the last time I represented the Native Hawaiian community was when I represented Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, in 2012 that ended. Um, so in the end of 2014, uh, five individuals um, that now make up Na'iau Puni contacted me about representing them. And, and uh, so, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to be the independent body that would use a grant from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to try and form a process for electing delegates to a convention. And uh, so I thought about it for a while and tried to think if, if I'm the right person for this. I mean, I was, I've, like a lot of the people here, I've always uh, dreamed of maybe being in the convention as a delegate or being a lawyer helping the delegates in forming the Constitution. But after thinking for about a week on it, I thought that, you know, maybe I have the right skill set to get this process moving. Because the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was, it is pretty hard to try and, and get this done in a way that we can use resources that are available in a way that's legal, for one. And number two, to do it in a way that um, there's trust and credibility to the extent that's possible under these circumstances. Um, not everyone's gonna be able to trust this process no matter who does it, no matter how they do it, no matter when they do it. Um, so so that, that's why I got interested in it and, and I'm really glad that I did. It's been a um, really great experience so far and, uh, and I think our, our goal is, is really important. One of the first things that we discussed together, the Na'iau Puni uh, directors and myself was what was going to be our philosophy going forward with this? And it became really easy. And our philosophy was going to be that we're going to make as few decisions as we can and because we want to leave everything to the delegates to decide, number one. Number two, we wanted to make sure that when the delegates got into the AHA, that it would be unrestricted. That is, you can decide whatever you want to do from a process point of view, how you organize yourself point of view, from what kind of recommendations you make, whether you want to just terminate it or not. I mean, that's self-determination. You get in there, you have all the power. We're just servants as far as providing a place and resources. Um, and, then, and then it was to make sure that it was legal. And one of the things we needed to do to do that was was we needed a, a grant from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And so we made sure that in the contract with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs that, that they agreed that, that they would not try and control us. We didn't need to consult with them. And so we made them promise that. And, but it was more than that. We wanted to make sure they truly understood it and believed it. And their lawyers, um, I think, drilled them on it. And they understood it. And I think at the end of the day, they understood that it needed to be that way, and so it has been that way. And you know, we, we don't see them, they don't tell us what to do, and I don't really know if they, they, if they like what we do, but it doesn't matter, you know? And, um, 
But when, you, when, I, when I think about why it is that, that it's so hard for Hawaiians to come together like this, um, it, it's because it takes a number of things. It takes, first of all, which is really a, a really difficult thing to do, is to have a role. You know, I mean, we're, we're 180,000 Native Hawaiian adults in the state of Hawaii. To get a group like that together to vote is really hard. I mean, you just can't go to the, you know, the, the Hawaiians that register with the, the state of Hawaii elections and get their names. That's not possible. And if it is, it, it might be state action anyway. It might be illegal. So the fact that the, the Native Hawaiian Royal Commission and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, whether you like those institutions or not, they did a great service by putting together a list that we're able to use now of 95,000 Native Hawaiians that are verifiably Native Hawaiian. And they're adults, we got their address, we know what districts they live in. I mean, it's a really hard thing to do. Um, that's a, that's a great opportunity that's present now. The other thing that's really hard to do is to get an institution like the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to give $2.5 million to a group of five people without any strings. Um, the only string is we can only use it for trying to run an election of delegates and aha and a ratification vote. But it takes even more than that to make this thing work. It takes that at this point in time you have, you've got a state government, you've got a federal government that is in favor of Native Hawaiians getting together to decide for themselves how they would like to move forward in unity or not. Even the DOI gets it in their report, the first page that they came out, their, their, their new proposed rule is, you know, it's up to the Hawaiians if they want to organize and if they do want to organize, what form they want to organize in, and if they do want to ask us, for uh, recognition, then it's up to them. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to get all those things together so that there is this opportunity, and uh, we happen to have it. One, one other thing we need, which hopefully we'll have good news tomorrow, is they did file a lawsuit against us to try and stop this on 15th Amendment, 14th Amendment, Voter Rights Act claims and First Amendment claims, and they're pretty complicated claims. We argued it before Judge Seabright and, um, on Monday, on Tuesday, and he's gonna rule tomorrow at 10.30. And if he says uh, the motion for preliminary injunction is granted, it's over. This opportunity is over. Um, if, he, if he denies it, like I hope he does, then we continue on. Uh, they might appeal from that moment on, until November 1st when it starts, they'll, they'll probably, if the motion is denied, probably appeal to the Ninth Circuit. We're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to defeat that one too because the Ninth Circuit will probably hear it before November 1st. But those are, the, those are all the things that have to come together to make this thing actually go to a vote on November 1st. Um, one of the reasons why um, uh, our group, Na'iel Puni and the directors and myself, are, are passionate about this process and why we believe in it. Um, the, the directors there, they spent a lot of time on this, they're totally unpaid, this is volunteer time for them, um, is simply this, it's, it's to provide an opportunity for Native Hawaiians, a substantial number of Native Hawaiians to vote in their leaders so that they can get together and decide and discuss and, and share their different ideas to see if they can come to a consensus on making a recommendation to Native Hawaiians generally. Now whether that process is, comes out with a, with a recommendation or not, um, to us, that's not really the most important part. The most important part for us and what we want to do and the reason why we want to get to November 1st is just to provide an opportunity for Native Hawaiians to get together. When I look at this um, brochure here, this, you know, they have all these questions on it. And uh, you know, I'm not going to try and answer all of them now, but, but I, you know, one of them that, that it says, uh, what are arguments against this process? And, and, and let me tell you the one that, 
that I think is a real one. And that is that I think, you know, we had to read a lot of stuff about constitution making. I don't know much about constitution making, so you read about it. And the one theme that comes through all the time is that it's successful if there's broad base participation. That's what makes it successful. And, and I think we do have broad base participation just because of the numbers, 95,000 you know, voters, 200 delegates. I mean, but I don't know that it's broad based participation. And I think those delegates that get elected, I think that's one of the first things they're going to have to kind of figure out for themselves. You know, because, because if there isn't good broad based participation, then they have other alternatives. Like instead of creating a constitution, it's thinking of a process to get broad based participation. And um, so, you know, when you, when you ask the question, you know, what are the arguments against the process? Well, I don't think it's an argument against the process because I think you can still use the process. But, you know, that's, that's one of the concerns I have. One of the things we try to do is we try to, to make the, the Native Hawaiians who believe in independence, to let them know that when you get there, you know, you can talk about anything you want. People tell me, well, you don't know about independence. You can't have, they can't decide independence at the, at the uh, convention because, you know, it's only Native Hawaiians. And it's like, no, but it can be a platform to discuss it and to move forward. Um, so let me check my time here. Yep, 10.57. Thank you very much. <laughs> Aloha. Um, like Professor McKenzie said, I only have five minutes, so this is going to be really fast and um, covering a lot of information. Um, before I get started, um, but what I really want to say is that I want to thank the Hui for inviting me here. I'm pretty excited to be here. Eleven years ago, I was a 1L, and I was sitting about where Nina Key is right now. Um, and as a 1L 11 years ago, the legal issue facing the Native Hawaiian people was the Doe versus Kamehameha case. And I remember being in this room and seeing Kumu John as a speaker there. Uh, so to be here tonight with Kumu John and Kumu Lilikala and Bill Mehewula, uh, it's really exciting for me. Um, again, and now I have about like four minutes and 30 seconds, and so I really want to just focus on what I really wanted to talk about, and that's about the importance of compartmentalizing this nation building process. Um, I've been very lucky to be in the position that I'm in and hear comments from the community, read comments. Um, and in all the comments or the discussions that I've had, what I don't see is a whole lot of uh, compartmentalization of these issues. Um, so for my discussion, I'm, what I'm going to focus on is the importance of distinguishing internal and external issues, and then when we focus on nation building, the importance of, of distinguishing between the logistical issues uh, that uh, is required for nation or government building uh, and distinguishing that from the substantive decision-making issues. Um, governments throughout the world distinguish their internal and external issues. And if we look at the United States, they have a Department of Interior that focuses on internal issues and the State Department that focuses on external relations and issues that are happening outside of the country. Um, the same thing is, the same thing applies with Native Hawaiians. We have internal issues, things that are issues that we need to deal with within the Lahui, and then there are also these external issues. And so nation building I consider to be within the uh, internal issue category. Nation building is about how Native Hawaiians are going to interact with other Native Hawaiians within the Lahui. Um, and so that's nation building. But when we look at external issues, um, the external issues are really where the Native Hawaiians are going to focus on how they're going to interact with external entities. And those external entities might be the state of Hawaii, the United States government, and the international community, including the United Nations or uh, members of the international community. Um, so those are our, our external relationships. Those are people or entities completely outside of the Lahui. Um, and even though these are distinct types of issues that also have their own processes, um, they're very relevant to each other. Because if you do not have a government, then there is nothing for anyone to recognize, whether that's, again, the state of Hawaii giving recognition to a Hawaiian government, the federal government, or even the international community. So. Like Bill says, broad-based participation is very important. But uh, again, 
these are very uh, important distinctions. And uh, at the end of my five minutes, I'll kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on why that's important to make those distinctions and what it means for us. Now, what Bill talked about in terms of Na'ya Puni, what they're doing, um, what they're really working on are the logistical issues. They're not dealing with the substantive issues. And Bill said, as much as possible, Na'ya Puni is trying to make the least amount of choices. And even Bill himself, in his uh, opening remarks, said you know, he had always envisioned that he would be on the convention floor participating in these substantive discussions. But instead, he's decided to help a hui of people work on these logistical issues. And so what are these logistical issues? Well, Bill's kind of said them before. Uh, Na'ya Puni has decided when this election and the convention is going to take place, uh, where, I don't know if they've made that public, where specifically the convention is going to be at. Um, and then they've decided who the election vendor is going to be. And based on comments you've made publicly, it sounds like you guys have had discussions about who are going to be presenters and maybe even uh, facilitators. So those are the real logistical issues. They're not the substantive issues. The substantive issues are in the hands of Native Hawaiians to decide. Native Hawaiians, through a democratic election process, will elect their Native Hawaiian convention delegates. Those democratically elected Native Hawaiian convention delegates will convene and they'll talk about, hopefully, they'll talk about uh, Native Hawaiian issues that are affecting us, how we can organize ourselves to better address those issues that, that affect us today. And then in doing so, they'll present proposals or maybe one proposal to the Native Hawaiian people to vote on. So the important substantive decisions are made by Native Hawaiians. Um, so again, you know, we've kind of compartmentalized this distinction between the internal issues and the external issues, the logistical issues of nation building from the substantive decision making. And when we can make those distinctions between the internal and the external issues, I feel confident that what it allows us to do, because I do believe that Native Hawaiians who want to create better conditions who want to manage and control our natural cultural resources. We all believe in having a government. That's, I think, we generally believe in that. And so by making these distinctions, I think it becomes easier to support, uh, maybe not necessarily participate, but support the idea that Native Hawaiians should pursue nation building. And at some point, they can get to the issue of who they want to get recognition from. And then when we look at the logistics versus the substantive issues, we can see that while Na'ia Puni is making decisions about how and where and when these uh, nation building activities are gonna take place, uh, Native Hawaiians are the ones who are responsible for uh, making the very important substantive decisions in this process. Thank you. History matters. History is not just what we perceive our past to be, definitely not what we wish the past had been. In the end, fact matters. Knowing the sequence of events, knowing what was done and said, knowing that past is how we understand and make sense of the present. A clear, intelligible vision of the present, what is going around us also matters. We gaze back, we look around, and we chart a course, course that takes us onward. As a people, we could conceivably sail anywhere. But as a people, we are on a voyage that was charted nearly 200 years ago, when the Kanaka Maoli in the throes of a horrific population collapse allowed our ali'i to lead us into a new future that broke with a thousand years of tradition and ushered in new religious practices, new and strange economic practices, and a new kind of authority, constitutional law that place the kuleana for ruling and maintaining our nation, not just in the hands of the ali'i, but in the hands of the maka'ainana, and also in the hands of people who came from other places, America, Europe mostly, but even those more recently arrived as contract labor from Asia. All were welcomed. All were invited to join Kanaka Maoli in their commitment to the nation, their loyalty to the monarch, and a new state was added to what would eventually be a global family of nations. We took great risks as a Lahui, allowing people who did not share our ancestry to belong to this nation. And one, one result of that risk taking was that some of those who managed to enrich themselves with great estates 
and even greater estimations of their own worth betrayed this country. They were a small minority, even among the other foreigners who were also Hawaiian subjects. But they were wealthy and influential with American politicians, and together with American political and naval power, seized our nation, humiliated our queen, and confiscated the lands belonging to her and to our government. The United States of America was never an unwitting partner in this chain of events. And worse, many Americans insisted their country's own ideals prohibited it from taking over another country that had never threatened theirs in any way. But real politic and strategic military and economic considerations overwhelmed that country's better instincts. And the US territorialized Hawaii in 19 1898, taking over all of our national lands and the property of the monarch as well. Representatives of the United States have not sought to ameliorate, but rather to disguise this theft ever since. In the Territorial Organic Act, the US permitted Hawaiians to vote in the elections while not requiring them to actually renounce their own nationality and identify themselves as American citizens. In the 1921 Hawaiian Homestead Act, the U.S. created the mechanism for offering hem homesteads and agri agricultural leaseholds, not as a just restoration of lands taken from Hawaiian nationals, but as a compassionate assistance to an economically failing ethnic minority. Indeed, the blood quantum requirement of Hawaiian Homes Act says nothing more clearly than that the more Hawaiian you are, the more assistance you require from the society. Throughout the 20th century, the American government in Hawaii created laws and educational policies designed to produce not just assimilation, but a sense of loyalty and patriotism to the American state by obscuring any reference to the fact that the US had supported an insurgency against the Hawaiian government in 1893 and had then accepted the spoils of that insurgency. At the time of the statehood vote in Hawaii, this American education had affected three generations of our people who had come to have wildly divergent ideas about this history, with the vast majority having no other information than that Hawaii had naturally evolved from some kind of makeshift kingdom to a fully-fledged state in the most powerful and respected country in the world. A significant contribution to this indoctrination was the replacement of Olelo Hawaii with American English as the national language. But remember, I said that we were on a course that was charted for us before the Mo'i signed the first constitution in 1840. Despite a shamefully constructed distortion of our history and demoralizing policies, despite the steady and spectacular loss of political power as Hawaii-born Japanese and more Hawaii transplants from the US replaced Kanaka Maoli as the major voting groups in Hawaii, there was an equally spectacular burst of political energy fueled by revivals in cultural practices, language, and also by resentment of the economic and environmental changes that unabated tourism and US military spending brought to Hawaii in the 1970s. The Hawaiian movement, which was really hundreds of movements, advocated for protecting protection of our vanishing ways of life and also advocated for established communities over new speculative real estate opportunities, and even challenged the US military's destructive and unconscionable use of our lands, not just on Kaho'olawe, but in Makua, Mokapu, and lately on Haleakala. In a supremely important way, our diverse political and social movements are what our Lahui has come to be. For almost as many generations as we had been sidelined by American decep deceptions, our people have, since the 1960s, claimed a kuleana for these lands, for our culture, for our sense of history, and for our destiny. And while some of us have grown old and others have passed, we have seen young people take up the struggle to restore a Kanaka Maoli authority and political power in our land. Consider the sequence of events. Um, 
Latin struggles on Oahu in the early 1970s, the Koholawe struggle since 19, since from 1975 to the end of the century, Hawaiian language revival and immersion schools since 1983, protection of our burial sites and remains since 1988, access and protection of subsistence and cultural access to the land highlighted by successful opposition to Senate Bill 80, in 1998, and a succession of political demonstrations demanding national rebuilding from Kalahui in 1987 to Onipa'a in 1993 to Kianusai representing the kingdom at The Hague in 1999, and finally, the emergence of at least a half dozen national governments since then. What some people have portrayed as disunity and confusion, I see as vital, informed, and a diverse movement to self-correct a hundred years of colonial-style education and suppression of our culture and our national identity. This diverse and vigorous movement is what has, in the last 50 years, obstructed the attempt by the powerful players in government, business, and labor to sell Hawaii, literally and figuratively. And since the first rendition of the Akaka Bill in 1994, the Democratic Party has sought to remove us as an obstruction by making a creature of its own, something that can claim to be the sole voice of the Hawaiian people and with which future agreements can be made. The pilikia is that Kana'i Oluvalu and Na'i Aupuni have both created as much cynicism as hope in the Hawaiian community, and thus have contributed to an actual disunity and not just a theoretical one. Claiming to be able to produce an entity that can speak with one voice for our people is not at all credible, given one, our history, two, our current reality, and three, the way these agencies have gone about their work. Na'iapuni's claim that it can be independent of Act, Act 195 is scarcely believable not just because of the wording of Act 195, but because of the interference by the Department of the Interior to smooth the way to federal recognition and federal recognition only. But Na'iapuni's greatest failure has been its insistence on a timeline that has forced Hawaiians to choose something that has no other objective and to arbitrary deadline, all the while intimating that this was somehow our last chance to participate in the rebuilding of our nation. It is the coercive nature. It is the coercive nature of this process that ultimately dooms it to failure. This I believe because I know our people and our history, and I have seen us choose to eat stones before. And coercion has been the hallmark of this whole process, from the legislation's insistence that our own resources at OHA pay for the role and the convention to the tune of more than $6 million, to Kanai Oluvalu's request to roll over names from other Hawaiian enrollments into its own. And now Na'i Aupuni seduces independent supporters into signing up, claiming that independent, independence too is a possible outcome of the convention. And here is where I go from skepticism to outrage. Independence. 40 delegates elected from who knows how many voters, but certainly less than 95,000, are going to be able to construct a government for all 1.2 million people in Hawaii Pai Aina, and they will do this peacefully? Perhaps if OHA had spent that $6 million in outreach and education, one could see a plan and a process and a rationale. But I do not think that Na'i Aupuni has done anything to educate even the 95,000 purportedly on this list. I would have more respect for this process if it had never pretended to be anything but a way to secure federal recognition through the Department of Interior rulemaking and an Obama executive order. At least people would, know what, would have known what they were signing up for. The State of Hawaii's Act 195 was completely clear in its language and intent. Recognize the Kanaka Maoli as the indigenous people of the state and provide the means to create a governing entity that can seek formal fe federal recognition with the United States government. The Department of the Interior's rulemaking draft is even clearer. A native Hawaiian government will not be eligible for the same resources as American Indians, and it may not challenge federal ju jurisdiction over military lands. Act 195 provides a path well-worn 
by hundreds, no, thousands of agreements with Native American nations who have eventually all succumbed to the U.S. claim of dominion over their lands and their fate. Many succumbed only after murder and terror pacified them. We have voyaged in difficult waters before, and I know that we have all had our moments when we simply wanted some small piece of what has been stolen from us restored. But I believe we are in this struggle for the long haul, and the long haul is what is required for us to resecure our country peacefully and inevitably. The long struggle is also what has shaped us as a people who have known the deepest kind of betrayal and have maintained our dignity and I think a sense of purpose. Our people are on a 200 year journey of nation building and rebuilding. We have time on our side, but only so long as we continue to fight. We have right on our side, but only as long as we remember. Thank you. John, this is why I thought it would be a good idea for him to speak because he's such a good speaker. How's that? Yep. Um, for me, land is the issue. It's the most important issue. We, need, we Native Hawaiians need land to live upon, and even if it's just a place to pitch a tent. We need land from which we will not be evicted and forced to live under a bridge to be swept away by flash floods. We need land to live upon where we can practice our culture and speak our own language. We need land where we can build our houses and our schools and our own health clinics. We need land where we can grow our own food. We Native Hawaiians are in crisis. We comprise a third of all the homeless, and we need land and housing now. And just as bad as homelessness today is the modern diaspora of Native Hawaiians fleeing Hawaii to find a house they can afford so that they won't be homeless. Today, 48% of all Native Hawaiians live outside of Hawaii because we cannot afford to live in our own homeland in the land of our ancestors, in the land where our ancestors have lived for 100 generations. Half of my cousins live away on the continent and yearn to come home. It seems like every month another cousin decides to move to Vegas or Oregon because the housing is cheaper. How long must we wait for a solution? Shall we wait another 20 years? Or shall we wait till 80% of us have to live away? I'm a grandmother now, and I worry that my grandchildren will not be able to afford land and will have to move away. Why? Because right now we have three generations living in one townhouse where four adults have college education and where three of us have PhDs. But if any one of us could not work, we could not pay the mortgage. And I'm a full professor. How do folks with less education and less pay make it in Hawaii today? The answer is simple. If they don't live at home, many are moving to Vegas. Housing now costs so much in Hawaii that shacks are going for 700000 and many houses on Oahu are going for one million. It's only gonna get worse. How will our grandchildren ever be able to afford a home? So we Native Hawaiians are in a crisis and we need land. In order to get land, we must have a government, a Native Hawaiian government, not a state agency who can negotiate with the state and the federal governments for land for Native Hawaiians. We must have a Native Hawaiian government elected by Native Hawaiians and serving Native Hawaiians. We need an Aupuni Malama Hawaii. We need a government who will take care of Native Hawaiians and make sure that we have land forever in our islands to practice our culture, to speak our own language, to grow our own food, and to pass land and housing on to our grandchildren. So how do we get a government? We have an option before us right now called Na'i Aupuni, whereby the delegates will be elected to write a constitution for a Native Hawaiian government. Then, if that constitution is ratified by Native Hawaiians, an election would be held to see the government. But some folks are saying this is a bad option, and they argue for us to wait for independence. The folks are Native Hawaiians. Some are my friends, some are my students, for whom I have great aloha, so I must consider what they have to say. One objection to the Na'i Aupuni process is that it's being paid for by the state agency, OHA, and that the roles being used are from Kana'i Uluvalu, also paid for by OHA. Some prefer that this process of collection of Native Hawaiian roles be done by a grassroots process and not by a state agency. 
so that there will be no influence from the state of Hawaii, even though the OHA funds are the 20% of the state revenues owed to Hawaiians by state law. Another objection to the Na'i Aupuni process is that it could lead to U.S. federal recognition of Native Hawaiians under American law. And they argue that federal recognition could prevent Hawaii from becoming independent from America again. I felt exactly the same way 30 years ago. I was one of the thousands of Native Hawaiians that worked for free for years, organized in Kalahui, Hawaii. We wrote a constitution in 1987. We held two subsequent constitutional conventions and registered 20,000 citizens. In 1993, we led a march of 18,000 to commemorate the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and to call for return of our sovereignty. In 1994, we wrote a manifesto supporting fundamental rights. And we worked at the legislature to ask for control of the Ceded Lands Trust. In 1995, we began sending a delegation to the United Nations to ask for international rights to self-determination and for decolonization. And we have done so every year since that time. And we pushed for federal recognition under American law in 2000. For 17 years, we seated a legislature that met three times a year on different islands, and we did all of this without state money. We believe there are four arenas of sovereignty work, and I can talk about that later if you ask a question about it. But you know our problem was? We didn't get one acre of land for our people after all that work. And why was that? We did everything right. We were grassroots. Our problem in Kalahui, Hawaii, was that we didn't have any legal way to interact with the American government. We could not work out a deal for federal recognition, and without it, we could not get any of the powers that be that is in the American government at the federal level to work with us. And we didn't believe we should work with the state of Hawaii. Our other problem in Kalahui, Hawaii, was that we had no money. And it was just too difficult to sustain political action as a part-time effort while working full-time to pay rent and buy food. Now fast forward 30 years. We Native Hawaiians don't have land. We don't have federal recognition. There are still 27,000 Native Hawaiians of 50% blood on the waiting list for Hawaiian homelands. And the other 450,000 of us who are Native Hawaiian, less than 50%, are being forced out of Hawaii in a modern diaspora by the super rich who are buying up Hawaii. There are many of us, and I am one, who are very glad that, that the state wants to give money to support social justice for Native Hawaiians and to help right the great wrong that was done in 1893. I think it is a sign of their aloha for us it costs money to organize national elections and to hold constitutional conventions. So I do not object to Kana'i Olovalu or Na'i Aupuni having state funding. In fact, I'm delighted that we can proceed with establishing a Hawaiian nation. So does that mean, as my colleagues would suggest, that I do not want independence for Hawaii from the United States of America? No, it does not. If I had a dollar for every time I told a non-Hawaiian that we still want the country back, and had them look at me as if I were crazy, I would be a rich woman today. <laughs> but the independent Hawaii that I want does not seem to be the independent Hawaii that others want. I want an independent nation that is for and by Native Hawaiians. I don't want to evict anyone, and I support giving everyone the basic freedom, freedoms of religion and speech, etc. But if I follow the Kalahui Hawaii Constitution, they would make non-Natives, whom we have married and whom we love, honorary citizens with all the rights of Native Hawaiian citizens, but not the right to vote or hold elected office, because we saw how that didn't work before. Yeah. I want an independent Hawaii that honors special rights for land, language, and cultural practices for Native Hawaiians. Many others want an independent Hawaii where Native Hawaiians have no special rights to land or language or cultural practices, wherein all people have so-called equal rights. This model sounds like what we have right now under America, and what would be the difference under independence? Since we Native Hawaiians are still a minority in our homeland, and since independence folks that I have talked with won't agree to give Native Hawaiian rights, I cannot support that model of independence. Here's something else. Both models for achieving independence for Hawaii, either decolonization through the United Nations or deoccupation through the American military, cannot occur without the agreement of the American government. Now, how long do you think it might take for America to completely withdraw its military from Hawaii? Will it happen in 30 years? in 50 years, in 100 years. I feel guilty that 30 years ago I opposed state support and moving ahead. I was wrong then, and I want to right that wrong decision. I can't wait another 30 years. I want to see a Native Hawaiian government in my lifetime, an Aupuni Malama Hawaii who will Malama my grandchildren, and I want that government to apply for US federal recognition for Native Hawaiians. I have read the DOI rules, the 75 pages. I find them quite fair especially in their, cure, in their care for the preservation of the rights of Native Hawaiians, small n, the 50% blood quantum, 
to the 200,000 acres of Hawaiian homelands. Will U.S. federal recognition prevent us as Native Hawaiians from achieving independence from America in the future? Will it stop the Kingdom of Hawaii that includes non-Hawaiian citizens from achieving independence from America in the future? The answer is no, but only if that is what the people want. Political boundaries on maps change frequently over the years, and it was once said that the sun never set on the British Empire, and of course now it does. <laughs> Those countries who were part of the British Empire were told that they could never become independent. But when the people of India wanted their country back, there was no stopping them. People's desires and political opinions make for political change, and laws and constitutions are rewritten. That is how the world really works. It seems there are 1,300 ahupua'a in the Hawaiian archipelago, and I want lands for our native Hawaiian nation in each of those 13 ahupua, 1,300 ahupua'a. I want those lands put into a trust so they can never be sold. I want a native Hawaiian government that will work continuously to secure the decommissioning of military bases. I want the 1,300 acres of Bellows Airfield in Waimanalo and the return of our sacred lands at Mokapu Marine Corps Air Station, where in the Kani tradition, the first Hawaiian man was made. I want all of our sacred mountains put into this trust. Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea, Hualalai, Haleakala, Pu'ukukui, Moaula, Lana Ihale, Ka Mako, Ka Ala, Kona Huanui, Ka Nehualani, Wai Ale Ale, and Pa Niau. I want the Aupuni Malama Hawaii to have co management of all the lands and waters of Hawaii, including Papahana Mokuakea. I want the federal monies that go to federally recognized tribes for housing, health, and education. I want us to build our own houses and schools. Did you know today that 40% of all children in the DOE schools are Native Hawaiian, learning almost nothing about our ancestral culture and barely able to pronounce our ancestral names? And did you know that out of all the children in the DOE schools, only 1% are in Hawaiian immersion? Do you think that our ancestral language will survive another 30 years of DOE mismanagement? So I ask all of you who are Native Hawaiian to vote for those leaders who want to write the best constitution possible. I recommend that we begin to study various constitutions and documents and declare allegiance to fundamental rights and to the support of Native Hawaiian lands, language, and cultural traditions. We should look at the Kalahui Hawaii Constitution. We should also look at the Bolivian Constitution that enshrined the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We should look at the Tongan Constitution that doesn't allow non-Tongans to own land in Tonga. <laughs> and we should look at the Cook Island Constitution that does not allow buying and selling of land at all. We should look at the Norwegian and Swedish constitutions that give free medical care and education to their people. We should proceed to make our native Hawaiian nation and ensure that we survive as a distinct people and culture in the land of our ancestors. We should invite our cousins to move home from the continent and make sure that they have land too. And when we have one million Hawaiians in Hawaii and we are in the majority once more, and when we can show the world how we malama aina and malama kanaka, then we can apply for independence. Now is the time for questions. So if you have uh, questions that you would like the panelists to try and address, uh, please give your cards. And I think um, while we do that process, I might just ask one or two questions of my own. And I. Um, I think maybe I'll ask Bill this first. Um, you know, Professor Osorio has made a very strong statement with regard to the process and pointed to its, its um, genesis in um, Act 195 and the obvious intention to move towards federal recognition. Is that the purpose, for instance, for, for Nutyal Puni itself to go forward? Um, do you see that as the logical outcome, the foregone conclusion? You know, the, the way I look at uh, Act 195 uh, is the same way I look at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and that is in order to provide this opportunity for Hawaiians to come together to try and move forward in unity, that we needed to use the role and we needed to use OHA's money. Um, those two institutions may want federal recognition, that wasn't our purpose. Um, despite what anyone thinks, I mean, we can't prove a negative. We just want to bring Hawaiians together. It's for them to decide what they want to do. You asked the question about whether or not it's a foregone conclusion. I don't know, 
But my opinion is that it depends on what the consensus within the Hawaiian community is. And I think that, that if, I think this process of bringing these leaders together, these 40 together, to deliberate with outside pressures and protests from others who don't believe, whether inside or outside, I think we're, we're gonna get closer to a step of, of finding that consensus. I think, you know, w probably the main difference between what John said and what I believe, the philosophical difference, is he believes, I, and I don't wanna misstate it, but because um, he, said, he said it so eloquently, that the, the process of going on right now with all these different groups is you know, an effective healing process that over time will be successful. And I don't, I don't know that's true. And it's the first time I ever heard that. I believe that if we bring Hawaiians together, that it's a better opportunity to move forward in unity. And why is that? Be because you need a, I think the, the, the nice thing about a government is, is that leaders have to be voted in. They share their ideas openly. They debate openly. Their ideas are tested. And if they can't agree, they're either voted in or out of office, and consensus is going to come about that way. As opposed to just staying in your own house and talking among your own folks and just getting ingrained and ingrained, hey, test these theories. I mean, if, it's, if your theory is strong, and if you're a great leader, go to that convention and convince the others. I mean, so that's the philosophical difference. Whether or not it's gonna turn into federal recognition, I don't know. I, I felt that um, Professor Kamele Hiva made a pretty compelling argument here for going forward with the AHA, especially in relation to lands and resources and eventually the ability to bring Native Hawaiians home to Hawaii. Did you have any further thoughts about that or specifically to address what Professor Kamealehiva has suggested? I mean, do you, are you asking if I think that Professor Kamealehiva is wrong about wanting to put people back on the land? No, I, I don't think she's wrong about that. I don't think that the, the yearning for that is, um, is improper. And I think I actually kind of alluded to that in, in my text. We get tired of struggling. And who wants to be defined basically as the people who struggle? But I am deeply concerned about the fate of ceded lands. And my real concerns were, um, were exacerbated actually by DOE's, uh, DOI's very sort of chilling message here. When you read through the 75 pages, and this is assuming, of course, that you, know, you get a federally recognized thing that comes out of uh, Na'iau Puni, and DOI is ready to embrace. The OI is saying, you know, you're not, gonna, you're not guaranteed any more um, American Indian monies. That's, that's different. You, you really are going to have to negotiate for those things or apply for those things with the federal government yourself. You can't touch federal lands. You can't touch federal lands uh, or federal jurisdiction lands. So that's all the military lands. But then it says, you know, what you can touch, basically, are the state-controlled ceded lands. So that's where you're going to have to negotiate for land. And my great fear, and all of us you know, have these kinds of places where we approach this, you know, our own rationale, is that this is exactly the, where the state is. It, it holds onto these lands. There's some question about whether it really has the right to you do whatever it, it wishes with those lands. We had a, um, a suit that Bill Meheula represented us um, in back um, five, six years ago. This, well, actually it was a long suit. And the, the bottom line to all of this is that I'm very concerned that what the state really wants is a final settlement. They want an entity that will dissolve any future claims to this land. And I worry that this is what is actually being created. Now, if a federal, federal, federally recognized entity is created, you understand 
that it will have very little leeway in terms of where it gets its revenues because the feds are promising nothing. It all has to come from the state. And that puts this new entity in a really difficult bargaining position. So in terms of my own worries and in terms of my worries about land, um, I'm just as concerned about Professor Kamei as Kame Professor Kamei Lehiva. I just see it differently. Can I respond to that, please? Uh, okay. Just two seconds. Wait, I can say it. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Let's start with Derek, and then we'll ask uh, Professor Kamei Lehiva to respond. Uh, thank you. Um, in r I just wanted to make a quick comment about lands or resources that a Native Hawaiian government will have. Uh, when I first interviewed for the position of governance manager at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, um, what I read into the position description and what was described to me during the interview was that uh, whoever got the position would be responsible for the transfer of all of OHA's assets to a Native Hawaiian government. And when we look at uh, OHA's strategic plan for 2010 to 2018, one of their strategic results is specifically the transfer of all of its assets, which right now amounts to about 550 to about $600 million. And that's in land and, and investment assets. So our trustees have made a commitment that uh, all of those assets will be transferred to a Native Hawaiian government. In addition, if we look at Hawaii Revised Statute, Hawaii Revised Statute 6K, uh, in it, it talks about the transfer of uh, management and control of the waters and resources of Kohalawe to a Native Hawaiian government. Um, government building is not a very easy task. Uh, when I was here at the university, it was great to write about nation building and the difficulties of it, uh, but going to this job, I found out that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of administrative tasks, and one of our administrative tasks is gonna be working on, that, on those transfers. Uh, but there are, even though the proposed federal rule, or at least the notice of the proposed federal rule, might not talk about lands going to the Native Hawaiian government, uh, there are land and assets that are that will be going to the Native Hawaiian government. I want to say that I agree with John. It never, ever should we uh, expect that anything will be easy. That uh, we should not, uh, you know, ex we shouldn't expect that they're all going to be nice. They probably are looking for a settlement, a final settlement on ceded lands. We always have to stand that that line and say no. No final agreement on ceded lands unless you want to give us everything back right now. That's a final agreement, okay? But that's that's something we're going to have to negotiate, and we negotiate with it uh, on that issue better when we have our own government. That's what I'm looking at. Whether we decide to go for federal recognition or not, that's going to be something as a vote of the people. But a government that represents our nation, the Hawaiian nation, the one I want to be independent, that nation can uh, negotiate over lands. And here's something else. If we do go for federal recognition, and it's probably one of the things I like best about federal recognition, I don't really care about money. I'm not supposed to say that, I know. I care about land. I want land for us to live on. We'll figure out the money part. We always have. But the interesting thing about federal recognition is that when bases decommission, if you are a federally recognized tribe, I would love to be that, thank you. I love my tribal brothers and sisters. If you're federally recognized, you get first dibs on that land. And when I heard that they were going to decommission bases, they're talking about decommissioning bases like they did with Barber's Point. If we had federal recognition then, we would have Barber's Point. It would be ours. When they're going to close down Mokapu, I want to be there. I want the key. I want to live there. When they close down Bellows, I want to make sure our people are moving in over there. When they close down Schofield, you know, this is my, my speech since uh, 1993. I have a list of all the bases I want to close. Right? This is what I want the government to do. I don't think I'm going to be in the government because then I'd have to give up my fabulous job at the University of Hawaii. But I want to ask the guys who get voted in to always, always get our land back and get those bases back and get the housing on the bases for us and get the schools on the bases for us. I want those bases. So I agree with John. And here's something else. I think we should always always be, be very wary of federal recognition and the federal government. Sometimes we get nice guys, sometimes we get really nasty guys. No, America can't decide whether they're nice or nasty. We can see that every day in Congress. But we need to make sure that we're moving ahead. And for everybody who says, let's not go with this process now, what's your timeline? 
And when are we getting land for our people? Because we can't have any more moving away. I can't have my grandchildren moving away. I can't do that. Yeah, thanks. Some of the questions that the, okay, let's clap for all of them. <laughs> I'm going to turn to some of the questions that have come from the audience. Um, first of all, let's see. This is for Bill and Derek. Um, in the history of OHA, and this is what the uh, person who asked the question says, in the history of OHA, I can remember that it has always supported a Native Hawaiian government and federal recognition. Uh, and the question really is, has the Democratic Party coerced OHA to fund the role or the election? Good luck with that. Yeah. I've been at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for a little bit over a year. Um, and as far as I know, the Democratic Party has not coerced the Office of Hawaiian Affairs into this. Um, I think, though, I don't think it's, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has been very supportive of a federal rule. And I don't think it's always been clear exactly what that means for them to support a federal rule. And the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, believes that the Native Hawaiian people, through this nation building process, should have as many options available to them as possible. And those options could be a government to government relationship with the federal government. It could be independence, uh, it, or it could be the status quo. And so in advocating for uh, a federal rule, the importance of realizing uh, the federal rule is that it doesn't grant a government-to-government -government relationship when they have this federal rule. All it does is it, it, it's available for Native Hawaiians to choose if that's what they want. Can I ask a question that? Because the Pohana actually said, he said this publicly, that OHA was required to pay for the role, and OHA was required to pay for the um, for the convention, then that's why those monies were set aside. Um, th this was a actually a fairly unequivocal statement. So um, I think that's cons coercive unless OHA came up with the original legislation, which I don't, I don't think they did. Um, yeah, OHA did not come up with the original legislation. Um, but the legislation, I don't think, even the legislation did not require uh, OHA to pay for it, and I think there's been some discussion uh, within OHA as to whether or not the legislature can actually direct the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to pay for things. But there was a, there was an, an arrangement, from what I understand, um, with support from the trustees that the trustees would support uh, the role. Mm -hmm. Question for all of you. Um, what do we risk if we postpone the process of governance building and federal recognition. Um, is Obama the best hope of securing federal recognition? <laughs> I'll answer, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, I think absolutely Obama's the best hope for securing federal recognition. If that's what you want, you know, I think, and I'm looking at it because of what everything I said, and uh, you know, it's passed out and it's gonna be, it's posted online and all that kind of thing. So you can see what my arguments are. But we don't know who's gonna be the next president. We may get uh, Donald Trump. America likes him, you know? And there's a lot of people, I don't understand why Republicans are so powerful in America because everything they do is so distasteful to me. But okay, lots of people like that. So obviously we could get Trump. I, Trump's not going to do anything for us because you know we wouldn't let him build his hotel, right? So no, okay. We have a we have a, a situation here where Obama is at least friendly. He understands, and he has been told by other natives who are in America who talk to him a lot that really he should do something for the Native Hawaiians. So federal recognition is what he thinks he has in his back pocket to give, perhaps, or to support. I don't know. After that. We got either Trump or we maybe we got Hillary or we got uh, Bernie. I'm for Bernie myself. But okay, <laughs> what are they going to do for us? Do they even know about us? Do they care about us? I don't know. I don't really know, but I know that Obama would like to do something. So I don't want to wait. Whatever that happens, if, even if, if we say the whole nation says, all the people, the 95,000 vote and say no to federal recognition, I still want a government. I want a government that is going to be advocating on our behalf that's not a state agency. And it's going to get the Ohamanis. I want to be able to vote and vote them out. 
Vote them in, vote them out. I think that's a great idea. And I want it to be not everybody votes for everybody, but you know, we got a representative from Oahu, we got a representative from Ko'olaupoko, and Maui has one, and Lanai has, and Kawa, et cetera. That's what I want. I don't think there's really any more <laughs> any more to say than that. Uh, Obama has been pretty clear since he came into office that if a federal recognition bill made it to his desk that he would sign it. And the fact that the Department of Interior has decided to uh, propose a federal rule is indicative, I think, of his policy of recognizing um, indigenous peoples and wanting to uh, recognize a native Hawaiian government. Um, but I, I think he is the best chance. If people want nat uh, federal recognition, then he is the best chance. If Trump gets elected, uh, I think it's, there's almost no chance of that happening. You know, I really would like to point out something that I think that Lady Kala understands as well, that, you know, the American government is really screwed up at this point. <laughs> and, and nobody talks about a, you know, a federal recognition bill coming through the legislative process because they know there's, there's not a chance in hell of that happening. So Obama would have to make an executive order sometime before he departs office. And it, it, it's... <laughs> And you're leaving basically, we're talking about trying to create a relationship with a government that has become really quite crazy. So that's something I'd like us to think about too. And to me, it's just rational, right? It's, it's, it's rational thinking. You're going into a relationship, you're gonna get married to somebody. Do you marry somebody who's betraying signs of you know, ab ab abuse and, um, and craziness? You, know, you, you have to be really, 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 really careful. So folks, if, and, and this I will say, I don't know that there's any stopping this process. I don't know that there's any stopping Na'iapuni and the AHA, but um, people are going into this, you know, I really, really hope that they're, they're keeping their eyes open and they're, they're, they're keeping the door <laughs> open for a quick escape too, because sometimes that's what you need to do to get out of a bad relationship. So, Bill, let me turn it over to you. One of the questions, and it follows uh, along the lines of what we've been discussing, if broad-based participation is important, why is this process being rushed? I don't, I don't think that if we, if we delayed this a year or two years, it would broaden it much. I think it's gonna broaden it more if you, if you do the process, number one, and number two, like I said, it's really hard to bring, have all the planets aligned in order to have this come about. And it's, it's right now, right? I mean, the roll ran out of money, so the list is gonna become stale. We don't know how long this money from OHA is gonna be available. We're doing it at a, at a time when a lawsuit is filed to stop this process and the DOI files an amicus brief in favor of our side. All these things don't come about all the time. And we can do this now if we, if we overcome tomorrow's ruling, that is. And Bill, let, let's uh, ask you the next question because you're actually the only one that can, can respond. Okay, John. I'm the only one it. up here who doesn't like this, so you, <laughs> you, have, to give, you have to give me a chance. Look, no, see, the, the reason why you take longer is, is that you actually do education. And, and I'm gonna tell you something. Um, I, I have been doing um, my point of, um, things, and these are really small things, right? This is just dealing with maybe a few hundred people on a Sunday afternoon who come through the my point of converse. And we are the only, this is the only time I ever see where we have conversations about what this could mean for non-Hawaiians, what any of these processes would mean. And I, I've always been really fair about this. I talk about federal recognition. I talk about independence. I talk about decolonization. But I do talk, uh, we do address what other, especially what non-Kanaka Maoli think about this. And I, I know that we all want to think that this is just a Kanaka Maoli process. But folks, there are 8 million other, I mean, 800,000 other people living here that don't have our ancestry. And what concerns me is I don't think there are any outreaches to the non-Kanaka Maoli 
population in Hawaii over any of this process. And it's really deeply disconcerting to me. And I think money and time needs to be put into that, but it also needs to be put into reaching so many of our own Hawaiian people who continue to be really concerned, skeptical, afraid um, ab about what's going on. So time matters. Time does matter. I want this to happen before I die. Time matters, absolutely. I want this to happen for my grandchildren. They're growing up. Time uh, does matter. Look, for how many, 30 years, we, we're, we, we did Kalahui for 17 years. We've been talking about it in Hawaiian studies. It's on, we, we have how many rallies. We talk about all these things all the time. Every time there's a land issue, we talk about this. If people don't know about it, what rock they've been living under? Come on, people know about these things. We have difference of opinion in this room, and it's good. Because we have difference of opinion in the room. People know about this. I have a lot of non-Hawaiians that come up to me, and they say, Lili Kala, we really want you to take care of yourself. You're going to see me hobbling along with my little walker, right? We want you to take care of yourself because you are fighting for your people, and we support Hawaiians. There's lots of non-Hawaiians who know about that. Right now, in Hawaii, what we don't have is control over our land base. We don't have a place where our people can live. I am so sick and tired of us getting evicted. Now, some people have Hawaiian homelands, and they're against this process. Then are they going to allow the homeless to come and live on their land? Some people own, this la own their own land, and they're against this process. So are they going to give that land to my grandchildren? This is what I want to know. How do we get land? How can we possibly get land? Sure, it's a very bad marriage with the American government. I agree a thousand percent. In fact, I'm not even for marriage at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I am for federal recognition because we don't have a choice. You're right, we don't have a choice and the time is running out for Obama anyway to be supportive of us. You know, sometimes you get good things to the American government, sometimes you don't. That you, that's really the history of Native America. Sometimes there have been really bad things that have happened and sometimes there's been better things. So I just came back from Alaska Natives. I went to their convention. They're buying back their lands. They're putting their lands in trust. They're making sure that they have land for their people. I, I think it's an important thing that we need to talk about, and we need a government that is not the state agency. We need that. So, I'm, I'm, so let's move ahead. Um, Bill. Yeah. So one of the actually we have a couple of questions but one of them is who are the five persons that contacted you in uh, setting up uh, Na'iel Puni? Yeah, I have the, I have a little vials of them. Um, the Kuhil Assam, he is the uh, director of uh, Little and Little Home, uh, executive director, he's been there for a few years. He's, uh, he's about my age, 62, he's uh, uh, the first Native Hawaiian child psychiatrist graduate graduated from John A. School of Medicine. Uh, Burns, yeah. See, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I wrote this wrong. So, uh, Pauline Namu, um, and she's associated with uh, Ahahui Kahahumano, and uh, she's retired. She's and they're all about sixties. We're all in the sixties. Uh, her past, she was a legislative coordinator for Ben Cayetano, uh, deputy director, uh, administrator for uh, Department of Public Safety, and she was a consultant for the Kaholawe Island Reserve Commission. Uh, Jerry Miyamoto, she's also a member of the Ahahui Kahamanu. Uh, she's a Hawaiian cultural historian. Uh, Kealoha Ballesteros, a uh, member of uh, Na Ali'i o Hawaii, and um, she, her uh, background was in financial management. Uh, Lehua Shoki, uh, she is also a member of uh, Na Ali'i o Hawaii, and she, in the past she was a paralegal and a med medical assistant. Great. Um, question for probably Derek and maybe Bill. If OHA is not supposed to have any say in the path that Na'iel Puni takes, why is a current trustee, Rowena Akana, listed as a potential delegate for Na'iel Puni? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, for the convention, for the AHA. Yeah, so right now she's a delegate, and or a delegate candidate, delegate candidate. Um, and she's running in her private capacity. Um, if Native Hawaiians uh, want somebody else to be a delegate, then they've got to put somebody else in there. Um, but she's in there, uh, she's running in her personal capacity, not in her capacity uh, as, a, as an OHA board member. And, and we, don't, we don't get to approve who applies to be a delegate candidate. This question is for, well, it says probably for Bill. The U.S. will be very reluctant to give up the military bases here because of their important strategic location in, the, in U.S. security. Um, would the new government be willing to let the U.S. pay to keep their military installations? It would provide money to pay for Hawaiian social programs, but would it be too onerous to the Hawaiian people? I'm actually going to ask Lily Kala to respond to that one. I want land rather than money. But, you know, the American government is going broke. I think everything's owed to China now. You know, when the Chinese take over the world, my name is Saifu. Just put that out there because that's my ancestor. Uh, <laughs> so you heard them talking about how they want to close military bases because they cost too much in Hawaii. We heard that. It's going to be cheaper for them to have their military bases in, on the continent and to have uh, faster airplanes that can go someplace or faster submarines, right? They're talking about closing bases. Federally recognized tribes get the first dibs on the base that's in their territory. We could have all those bases ourselves. So I would much rather have the land than the money. Always we want the land rather than the money. Yeah. Um, this question is for Professor Osorio. Um, Lili Kala has raised a point about already trying a grassroots movement uh, process within the Hawaiian community, Kalahui Hawaii. And she mentioned that they could not go forward without a process that the U.S. would actually recognize. What do you think of this point? Kalahui did not succeed because the, the timing wasn't right for it. Um, but Kalahui also didn't succeed because it was a grassroots community initiative. Um, this process that we're talking about here um, is actually being, it was initiated by the state. It is being pushed really by people who are, who are either in state agencies or, you know, it's, it's a different kind of initiative. So, yeah, that we're talking about two different things. If there was a truly grassroots movement of people who wanted to set aside their differences, combine kingdom governments, um, work toward a, a process where you know we could basically s try and speak together as one voice, um, you know I think it would be a powerful thing. Would it succeed better than Kalahui? The times are different. Um, who knows? But I don't think I don't think that Kalahui's failure to get recognition um, in the nineteen in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties was a result of not doing things right. I think you guys did everything right. I just think that the state wasn't willing and didn't see at that point the threat that was actually being presented by people who were presenting ideas about independence and saying, you know what, we don't even think the state exists. We don't think the state is, um, has any right over our, our properties. I think their willingness to negotiate now is a direct result of the independence movement. Wait, I want to answer that. Actually, the state wanted to help recognize Kalahui, Hawaii in 18, uh, 1995. We went to them to ask for the control of ceded lands, but we didn't accept their offer. Kalahui didn't accept their offer. That was a mistake we made. We wanted to have it come from the federal government, not from the state government. And so I think there have been people in the state of Hawaii government, both in Democratic and Republican parties, who have supported Hawaiian rights, who are ashamed of the way the American government has treated us, who are ashamed of the way the military has behaved towards our lands. And, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that. 
it's not all black and white. There are people who are non-Hawaiian who are supportive. I want one million Hawaiians before we go independent. So all of you still making babies, 10 babies each, thank you very much, okay? I want to have more and more Hawaiians, and why? Because when we had a kingdom, and we let the non-natives vote and have hold office, which is what Kalahui was against in this new constitution, when we had that kingdom, they did betray us because they had a chance to do so. Now, if we go independent tomorrow and we're still a minority, what do you think we're gonna get? People are calling me a racist because I want land for Hawaiians. So, wait, are we talking about a Hawaiian nation? We're talking about a non-Hawaiian nation. If we're talking about a non-Hawaiian nation, we might as well stay part of America. What's the difference? I want land for Hawaiians before we go independent. I want the demarcation that said, this is where Hawaiians can live forever, not sold, not sold to anybody, but always for our people to live upon. That's what I want. Okay, um, this is for Bill. Um, what kind of possible claims could the US Supreme Court um, hold against the nation building process. Can you, you've talked a little bit about the Akina case, but can you kind of expand a little bit on what the claims are that are being made? You know what, I, I'm not gonna do that. Um, you know, <laughs> people could be watching this, a judge could be watching this, and I'm just gonna let them rule tomorrow, sorry. Question for John, and actually this is a kind of a follow-up to the discussion with Lily Kala just now. Do you believe that Native Hawaiians are an indigenous people of Hawaii, and that as an indigenous people, we have a right to organize our own government distinct from what might become an independent Hawaii? Thank you for the hardest question of the night. <laughs> Hawaiians are an indigenous people. Hawaiians are also the descendants of Hawaiian nationals and citizens of the Hawaiian nation. Um, is it possible for a person to have both those qualifications in a modern state? It absolutely is. It is possible for a person to be a part of a broader country that includes you know, both native and non-native people and still have the protection of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These things have actually been assured by, by a number of people who have, been, who have looked at how this, these, this thing has emerged, how's, how UN DRIP has, has emerged, and, and its relationship to the process of decolonization. The, the really, really tough things, you guys, and, and the, the conversations we never, we never ever get to enough so that we can actually uh, agree on, on what the reality is, is that there is there is the, the, the possibility of decolonization. There is the possibility of demonstrating that the United States committed, co committed real violations of the UN po uh, process in 1959 when we were made a state. There really is an opportunity for there to be a conversation about what kind of independent country we have. Now, you know, the people who would object to that would be the United States, you know, who wants Hawaii to stay a state. But also, there are kingdom people who would object to that. And un until we understand you know, how international law actually works and what agencies are actually there for, for, to help us, we get really, really confused about these things. Hawaiians are an indigenous people. Hawaiians are also descendants of nationals who had their country taken from them. Hawaiians are also the victims of colonial processes that, that existed from 1898 all the, way uh, all the way to the present. So you want to really understand this stuff? You, 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 have to, you have to see the complexities of it. And yes, I know, we want land and we want land now, but I don't want to. I don't want to trade. No, I don't want to trade land for clarity. For many years, I've taken students to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. We always ask for the country back. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen decolonization in the Pacific, and that's been brought forward by the Permanent Forum. There, Tahiti is on the list. France has agreed 
for Tahiti to go back on the list, so th there's an interesting thing. What's great about Tahiti is 80% of the people are Tahitians. What's also great about Tahiti is that there's a very light French footprint there in that Tahitians all own beachfront. The Tahitians eat from the ocean and the land. So really, if they're going to go independent tomorrow, they will be Tahitian nation. And I love that, and I support that. So we've got a chance you know, to follow on those coattails, but it's no use being independent if we can't control our land. We must have land to control. So I've been going to the UN, I look at this, and it takes a, a process, and we could perhaps uh, cajole uh, some American government to agree that we ought to go through the process. But when we're a minority in our own country, that process isn't going to do much for us. Now I want to just point out something that my friend Robin Danner says, and I want to shout out to Robin. She told me, she said, look, when the American military invaded in 1893, there were two sets of people that John's just been talking about, two sets of people that got hurt. And there's two sets of remedies. The Native Hawaiians were hurt because our country was taken. And the non-Natives, who were part of the, the national, they were hurt because the country was taken. So there are different ways to go about solving that problem. One way is to push for our rights as indigenous peoples, which could include federal recognition and could include the base is coming back to us in various lands. Look, my little green paper I put around out there. You know, Clay Koa said to me, where's the facts, Lily Kala? So I put out some facts, okay, very good. But the other part of it is to go independent again for the people who are descendants of those nationals or who would like to be those non-natives. And why couldn't we do both? Why could we not do both? I always want to have the people who want independence, including myself, because I have my own brand, right? I want those people to always speak up. We can never say no to that. Because we know, even if we get federal recognition, even if Obama was in the office again, or somebody better, that we're gonna have problems with the American government. The Republicans hate natives all across the land. They don't want us to have any land. You understand, if we're federally recognized, we will be the largest native nation in America with 500,000 people. They're scared of that. They don't like that. So Republicans are gonna be against us forever. We need to have the independence discussion going on. At the same time, I think we also need to have federal recognition. By the way, I wanted to test the waters. People are telling me not to do this. You know, I, I never listen to what people tell me. I am running for this constitutional convention because I have written constitution and I want to write a constitution. I want to see constitution. And I'm running because I do want federal recognition. So if you want federal recognition, you vote for me. If you don't want federal recognition, don't vote for me. Then we're gonna find out right away if I get in or not, okay? Mahalo. <laughs> so I wanna follow up uh, a little bit on the decolonization issue and I'm gonna ask Derek if Hawaii possibly got re-enlisted as a non-self-governing territory, um, who would you envision could participate in any plebiscite on um, our status, the status of Hawaii, and um, would, there, would attempts to limit participation survive uh, possible challenges? Hard question. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Kumajan, I don't think you had the hard question. I think this is the hard question, and I think I know who wrote it. They just get harder and harder. <laughs> um, I guess I should probably say at first, I'm not an expert on the decolonization process, but the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, commissioned a report from uh, law professors James Anaya and Robert Williams. And James Anaya, for six years from 2008 to 2014, was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, and in his report, which I think is available at oha.org slash Anaya Williams, um, the report is there and he, what they do is, uh, they ask, they respond to a few questions, but they do, uh, address the issue of a decolonization process. And I think um, Kumulili Kala kind of implied it, uh, but there's a big difference when you have a territory that's being, uh, going through the decolonization process and the majority of those people are indigenous people. And that's very different from in a territory that's going through the decolonization process and the indigenous people are the minority. So the question of who gets to participate, and this is actually being a question uh, that, that Guam is dealing with also. Um, James Anaya says that 
the territories are what's being decolonized, not the people. And so the people who get to generally participate in a decolonization process are the inhabitants of that place. Now he has said that um, there can be some exclusion. Like you can go back and say uh, people who maybe 20 years ago, uh, so we're, what, we're in what, 2015. So if we were to go back 20 years ago to uh, 1995, in a decolonization process you might be able to say people who moved here after 1995 wouldn't be able to participate in a plebiscite. Uh, but he said it was very doubtful that uh, a UN committee or the UN working group on decolonization would allow going back to 1893 as a cutoff to prevent people from participating in a decolonization process. And so that was something that he raised as a concern. Um, if people, uh, if Native Hawaiians are a minority in the decolonization process, uh, that decolonization process probably won't help to address the issues that indigenous peoples are really concerned about. Um, but actually, they could roll it back to a, a more meaningful time, right? Like 1947, or 1959, back really when the violation takes place. I mean, because, you know, and we see this in the case of New Caledonia. Um, originally, the, the French and the New Caledonian people basically negotiated um, one settlement, and, and they were going to hold a plebiscite in 15 years, and the French started moving a whole bunch of French nationals there, and they eventually had to negotiate a new agreement, right, um, to exclude those people. So, frankly, it, it, it would be uh, certainly possible to discuss other kinds, other time periods when, you know, you, you actually punish um, or you actually adjudicate according to the harm. We're still a minority. Oh, that time. Yeah. Oh, we'll see. That's good. If, uh, for those of you who are interested in the question, I would really recommend checking out the report. And again, that's at OHA.org. But um, they do kind of talk about New Caledonia too. And they talk about how New Caledonia is very unique because in their decolonization process, they really carved out uh, an effort to protect indigenous rights also. So I don't, I don't want to make it sound like they're opposed to the decolonization process, but I think they give a fair assessment of the decolonization process and try to illustrate uh, the concerns that Native Hawaiians, the concerns and benefits that Native Hawaiians would have from that process. Oh, okay. Professor Kamehilehiva seems to suggest that this process, the um, Na'iaupuni, the AHA process, has the potential to return lands to the Native Hawaiian people. Is this guarantee in any way, should this process, should the AHA uh, succeed? Is it something that would need to be negotiated with the American government? And what incentive would they have to return any lands or to decommission? military installations? Great question. Thank you. I like that one. Um, you know, we're dealing in snake oil. Uh, the guys don't really want to give us back anything, really. We know that. I just think if we have a government who uh, is dedicated to dealing on those issues for us, that's not a state agency, we have a better chance of negotiating. And they're going to decommission bases. They have to because they can't afford to be here in Hawaii. And as the cost of living goes up and more millionaires buy here, you know, there's some houses in Kona that are going for two million and four million dollars, a house in Kona. Okay, so as it goes, the cost of living is going up and up, they're gonna have to decommission. So I just wanna be in a position to get those lands to come back to us. Right now, we're stuck in American law. Hello, the American military is here, it's our reality. We can say we're independent, we can say we're, we're sovereign nation, we can't even walk onto Mokapu, okay? We can't even go there to worship if we want to. So the reality is that we have to deal with American law. What is the American law? Federal recognition. Can we carve out some lands? Everything will be in negotiation. And I think we've got some people, non-natives, who are on our side who say, yeah, we should do this. A wrong has been done, not only in Hawaii, but in D.C. I think there are lots of people out there in America who say, look what's happened to the Hawaiian people. They don't have any land, it's a terrible thing. People know Hawaiians are moving away, right? Everybody understands this. And I just, I feel so badly for my cousins who are really getting older and have to leave our land because they don't own anything here. We have to address that, folks. Whoever we are in this room, whatever our point of view is, do you have a piece of land? Good, 
My cousin needs to move home. Make sure that there's some room for them. I can't fit anybody else in my house. How are we taking care of that? Do you see the point? I want us to now, right now, tonight, say, we want to take care of the homeless. We're going to make sure nobody gets evicted anymore, nobody gets swept anymore. Next time they're going to do a sweep, I want all of us to be down there. Everybody in this room, standing in solidarity with the people who don't have a house, and say no eviction. We should be opening up every single state park to the homeless until we have housing for them. That's our solution. We should not be evicting them, especially the families with children. This is a terrible thing we're doing. We're allowing it to happen. So this is, to me, the biggest issue, as I've said before. And you know, um, we're dealing with people we're going to have to negotiate. We cannot just trust, absolutely not. We're going to have to stand together, different points of view about it, and say, you have to deal with us because we're organizing. we got a government, and we're electing them, and this is what we want. Okay, so please vote. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our time, but there, there are a couple of questions that I think are very important to um, address, and I'm going to ask Derek to begin. Um, what happened between the Kingdom of Hawaii and the United States is an international violations of law. So it has always been from day one until today an international issue. Why do you insist in making this event a domestic issue where the United States will always be in control? The Queen in her protest um, looked at the continuation, locked in the continuation of the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom. So the question really is, why f go for federal recognition when we're dealing with international law issues? That's a very, um, I think that's a very nuanced question, um, and I've gotten nuanced responses for that. Um, and I think that really actually goes to the question, yeah, I think that goes to the question um, that was on the flyer which is, will federal recognition prevent any hope for a fully independent nation for our Lahui in the future? Um, Native Hawaiians pursuing self-determination as indigenous peoples is a pursuit under very specific claims, and those are separate and apart from rights and claims that can be pursued as a nation state. So to pursue claims as indigenous people, I don't think it forecloses any claims as a nation state. Uh, in the Anaya Williams report, they kind of get to the question of whether a government to government relationship could impact uh, any claims under international law. Um, they say it almost most certainly won't. And uh, honestly, that doesn't sound very certain at all, especially when it says almost most certainly. Uh, but having had the opportunity to talk with them about it, you know, they, and they say this in their, in their report, that if Native Hawaiians are concerned that participating in this process would lead to that, that they could make a declaration, a clear declaration, that by participating in a, a federal rulemaking process or a government-to-government -government, uh, relationship, that they agree to these very specific and limited terms. Um, you know, so that's what's coming from him. Um, I think... Uh, personally, and I, you know, have to say that this is not necessarily a board position that's been taken, but I think the discussions that we've heard tonight is uh, basically boils down to that we have very urgent, immediate needs that need to be addressed now, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now, and we also have some long-term aspirations, and we need to find a way to, I think, address and balance. The, both of those interests. We have people who are homeless. I don't know how many of you know where OHA's new off, newer offices are, um, but it's in Evile. And every morning, unfortunately, I don't have uh, parking at the office of Point of so I park on the street. And every morning, there's a sweep of homeless people on the sidewalks. And there are a lot of Native Hawaiians. This morning, I dropped off a box of about eight to 10 avocados outside of a tent. We have real issues, real issues, not just homelessness. We have issues with diabetes, breast cancer, uh, 
issues of Native Hawaiians having disparate treatment in the criminal justice system. We have so many real problems right now, it's not funny. And these problems can't wait for a resolution for 50 years. These problems can't wait for the international community to lend an ear or a hand. I feel we need to take charge today, not 10 years from now. We need to do what we can today to protect our assets and resources. Recognizing that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has committed to transferring all of its assets to a Native Hawaiian government, it's huge. Right now, our trustees are elected not by Native Hawaiians exclusively. They're elected by everyone who votes in Hawaii. So our ability to manage our resources, it's not happening. The sooner that we have a government that we can transfer those resources to, that government can start to address the urgent needs of our people. As I said, we're coming to the end of the, our time, and I would like to give each panelist like two minutes to kind of do a wrap up. I think Derek did a really good, a good wrap up of his position, so I, I will count that, and then let's start with <laughs> let's start with Lily Kala. It's very hard for me to talk for only two minutes, as you can tell. I want us to have aloha for each other, and I'm really glad that. The, um, John and I have been friends since seventh grade at Kamehameha, and... How long did you like me in seventh grade? <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> 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 well, that was a long time ago, too. But, you know, over the years, we've disagreed on quite a number of things. We even disagreed about Kalahui's, I remember. And yet, we work together because we believe in one thing. We believe in supporting our nation. We believe in supporting our young people and that they should have the best education possible. So as we look, as I look around, you know, we have non-native students in Hawaiian studies as well. So I look around and see how we provide the very best education we can with the least amount of resources that this university does not give us enough. We see that education is making a difference. And so I, I agree with John. I just don't think we have to wait any longer for a government. We can proceed with the government. We will educate more. We will change our constitution. We will find better ways to do things. I really want to support no private ownership of land on our trust lands. I don't want buying and selling of land. I want to make sure the land is there forever. So that's a, a real discussion. How do the Tongans do it? How do the Cook Islanders do it? Let's figure it out. That's my point, is that we will still be learning from each other, and I always learn from John. And as you call, I was the one who said, bring on John. We should have John. See, I'm a, I'm a groupie, John groupie. There you are. Um, the most important thing is that, you know, I have students in here tonight. I, ha I teach a law class. Two of those students showed up. I teach a music class and like nine of them are here. <laughs> Go figure, I, I'm so proud of you. Um, look, I've sat in a, a lot of meetings over the last few years, you know, when OHA was doing their Kaumaea process, I sat with uh, representatives of different kingdoms. I realized, you know, that, you know, that there's like, you know, a half a dozen of these, Different entities, and they and they're all approaching the, the issue of governance and government and restoration slightly differently. Um, sometimes it was really frustrating to think that we were never going to be able to get people to speak with one voice. But at some point, I realized, you know, that one of the things about this movement has been the amazing, not just aloha, but patience that we show with each other, and and the openness with which this movement has actually generated so many wonderful and amazing things because we don't shut people off and shut people up. And we don't, we, we don't isolate and, and alienate people who have di differing ideas. Um, the thing that is chilling to me about, um, about the DOI version of this, this process is they're saying it's one government and one government only. One entity and one entity only. And while I, I, I really, 
I agree with so many things that Lili Kala says about what should be our processes and our values in a new government. I do wonder to what extent we're going to be able to continue to influence something once it is a government and um, really lend the stamp of openness and acceptance and aloha for one another that has really marked um, this movement. Those are my concerns. And I'm really, really grateful for the chance to be here tonight. Thank you. You know, I've, I've uh, known Lily and uh, John for a really long time and uh, actually represented John in the Seated Lands case. And, uh, and I, I, I've, I've been an independence person, I've been a federal recognition person, and now I'm a I want what the majority of the Hawaiians want person. <laughs> so, and are there risks with the, uh, the one thing about, I mean, you talk about, there's been a lot of talk about where if there is a government, then you can do some negotiations and stuff. And, and, and that's what they call standing. And, you know, that's why Native Hawaiians can't make a claim for the ceded lands or make certain claims as a people is they don't have a government, a government that represents all of them. And when there, when there is a government, if there is a government, then they'll have standing to do things like that standing like to receive lands. Um, but how much you get and what you get is, is skill and how you do it. And, and again, does, does that mean we don't do it because there's risks? Or do you trust our people that we can do it? And I'm, I'm in the latter part. I say, I trust Hawaiians. I think collectively and individually we're smart, but I think collectively we're stronger. I just wanted to share one other thing, and that is, um, you know, I, I, I'm more of a process person now instead of content. That's why I don't have too much to say. But, uh, but um, so one of the things we thought of was if we bring in all these, all these different uh, delegates together you know, the first time, they've all been locked in into their individual ways of what they want. So how we're going to break this down? So the first, the first week we have this. Uh, instruction process set up, and this is what it's lined up for. We got a constitution building uh, process professor. This guy's uh, advise advise nations around the world. Uh, his name is Zachary Elkins. I actually got his name from our meeting, John, when we met, and he turned me on to that article and called him up, and and he's going to do the first day. And he's the one who really taught us about you need broad-based participation, otherwise it's not going to work. And, uh, and so he's going to start it off and focus on that and focus on how, you know, give ideas on how to organize themselves so that and what to focus on and, and what sequence of things to focus on. Um, so that's the first one. Second, second day we're going to have Rebecca Soshi, and she is... Um, an expert on Native American law and federal recognition. So she's going to talk about, and but she knows a lot about the Hawaii experience, Native Hawaiian experience. So she she can kind of explain, you know, how it fits, how it doesn't fit, what are the risks, what are the benefits, and sort of uh, say that. The third day we're going to have uh, Julian Agawan, and he's going to talk about the three um, regimes of of uh, international law that may apply to Native Hawaiians, uh, decolonization, um, deoccupation, and then uh, the rights of indigenous people under international law. Um, the fourth day, we're gonna have Melody. And Melody's gonna talk first half of the day on ceded lands. And then the second half of the day, she's gonna talk about the uh, United States constitutional uh, issues that apply to Native Hawaiian governance. You know, what are the what are the risks out there, and what do you have to be aware of? And the last day, uh, we're looking for someone to teach uh, kingdom law. I've asked John to do that. He's 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 still considering, right? No, no, I declined. Oh, you declined? Oh God! I thought in front of everybody you would do that. You know, 
Well, I, I would think we, you know what, you can try and persuade them to stop too, I don't care. <laughs> so anyway, uh, who would you recommend? Okay, okay. He, he didn't return my call though, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then we're also going to have the last day. We're going to try and get a compilation of all of the different uh, constitutions that, like uh, Kalahui Hawaii, and that have come forward, and uh, compile them all, and and uh, and have someone sort of give a a summary of of what they are, how they were developed, what the philosophy, main philosophy behind them, and what are the differences. So. And, and, and we're going to have a, a moderator, really good moderators, that, that first week and then the second week to try and help organize the group. But I thought if, if everyone sort of had a baseline of what independent people thought of all these things, then when they start to talk about all these things, you know, and someone says, hey, yeah, but, you know, we can get all of this, everyone's going to go, ah, you know, well, the experts said, kind of keep everyone grounded, you know. So thank you very much. So I want to thank our panelists tonight. It's been a really interesting, rich, kind of deep discussion. And I encourage um, these kinds of discussions to keep going on. I think, I think all of our community benefits from that. Um, please join me in giving a big round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. And now I believe that we're going to sing Hawaii Aloha.